Hello, and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. Welcome. I, my name is Elizabeth Carney. I would especially like to thank our media partners, all of whom are great for adding to your punch list. We'll get to that later on. St. Mary's College, School of Economics and Business Administration, ESGX, and HIP Investor, Bioneers, who will have their event in a couple of weeks, and Pachimama Alliance, who's having their annual event tomorrow with Paul, who's just published a new tome, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. Paul, welcome. Elizabeth, thank you so much. It's nice to be back. We had fun when we were introducing the Drawdown book here. We did. I remember how much fun we had. And now you are back with a new book, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. And I'm really curious about your journey. I'd like to know a little bit about um, what brought you to write it, especially for someone I just feel like you've been dedicated to the earth your whole work life. Thank you. Um, there's several ways to look at that question with respect to the book itself. The first is that I knew I was going to write it uh, even before I completed Drawdown. So it has a different function. Drawdown is very much about what we can do in order of impact globally. And regeneration is about how to get it done. And mm -hmm. there's many more solutions additional to Drawdown and other uh, solution providers in the world besides Drawdown and besides Regeneration included in the website of the book. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, the book is a neurotransmitter that goes to the last section, which is called Action and Connection. The whole point of Regeneration <laughs> is to act and connect, mm -hmm. or maybe it's connect and act. And that points to the website. Uh, which is the most important part of the book, actually, is the website. It's, it's not like an add-on or afterthought or, you know, pointing back to the book itself. It, the book is pointing to the website. Tell us the name of the website. Uh, regeneration.org. And were we lucky to get that URL? I can't even tell you. Yeah. Well, I, um, I want to talk about those punch lists a little bit later on, because I think I've seen some things there that are super interesting. But before that, I thought we would think just a little bit more about, like, what was it? What have you learned? What was it, what was it like to write that book? What, how did you assemble your ideas? Like, tell us some stories about its making. Sure, well, going back to the first question, really, there's another purpose for regeneration, the title. Uh, there's two parts to the title, the title and the subtitle. Um, I've been looking, reading, uh, and um, the climate literature and what I call climate speak uh, for a long, long time and sort of watching it. I don't have much of a science background. I have an English background. <laughs> I'm an English major. And I love language, and I appreciate language for what it does and can't do, um, and the power of English or the power of language when it's used properly. And what I noticed was that the climate dialogue or the climate reporting or the climate um, jargon, if you will, or the jargonization of climate, really, um, was actually driving people away from engagement, activity, and involvement. And everyone can see the same, saw the same thing I see, uh, or sees the same thing, which is that the, it's, the verbs that are used are fighting and tackling and combating, and mitigating, conquering, um, as if climate change was the enemy, number one, and using war and sports metaphors, which are very, you know, which gender do those come from? We can, <laughs> and then, um, but then using them as if climate change was the problem and that it's an it somewhere that, you know, you can go fight. 
And so there's so many problems with the, uh, like I say, the, the way that we, we language this in the media and television and videos, uh, in blogs, etc. People have been left frozen. Well, I mean, first of all, it is not an it. There's, it's, this is othering language. Hmm. We are the women, you know, Muslims, you know, different races, ethnicity, sexual practices. Diff- I mean, we are in the othering era, you know. And othering is the cause of global warming, not the solution. Mm. Because it, if it's other, and you can then other the ocean, you can other other forms of life, you can other the land, you can other the whole world and take whatever you want, and then the waste goes to somebody else at some other time, downstream, whatever. There is no other on this earth. It's one It's like system. throwing things away. There's there no is away. no away. Exactly. And so, so what I want to do is just bring it back. First of all, the climate is supposed to change. It's a miracle. It's beautiful. We wouldn't have snow, ice, rivers, water, you know, honey, hummingbirds, you know, forests, all the beautiful things that make this so, so miraculous were it not for climate change. The climate is supposed to change, okay? Second of all, it is not the problem because nature never makes a mistake. Hmm, important point. Because <laughs> it can't. We do. And so we have to look at the cause of warming because it's the warming of the planet that changes climatic uh, expression. And, I mean, without nerding out here, I mean, there's two ex- two causes. One is the jet stream, that is the movement of air in the atmosphere, and then there's oceanic currents, which is the movement of currents. And both of those are um, basically ruled scientifically by fluid dynamics, one of the most complex science endeavors in the world. It's so complicated. But as those change, you know, climate changes. As climate changes, the weather changes and so forth. So by by othering it and so forth, we have basically under the delusion that there's something that can be fought or combated or tackled. That's a wonderful one. I like tackling it. And the problem with that is then that the individual feels like, well, I can't do that. I hope they do, whoever they are. And so that's why 98% of humanity is completely disengaged from climate. They may think about it. They may be empathetic, but they don't do anything at all, virtually. And so here we have the greatest crisis civilization has ever faced, and I hope ever will. Uh, And somehow we have spent 50 years communicating in such a way that 98% of the people are not involved. That was why I used the word regeneration. I wanted to change the framing of of what the um, solutions um, express and the possibilities uh, as opposed to dwelling again and again on the probabilities of what's going to go wrong, how fast, mm. and how fast is it going wronger. Well, if it's all about jet stream and ocean currents, then to make a silly joke, we should be going with the flow. Well, it, it, if we, go, we as soon as we talk about that, though, most people, most of the world can't think that way. They have everyday lives, they're pressed, they're stress, they have needs that they must mm. deal with every day. And so we've communicated with metrics and jargon and, you know, acronyms, you know, and this was flying back and forth, yeah. you know, is right now is, is quintessentially true with the conference of the parties. And yet it doesn't reach people at all. That's not a way, that's not storytelling. That doesn't yeah. really give people a sense that the solutions to reversing global warming are actually inherently ones that cause great benefit for everybody in the world, virtually everybody except people who are super rich. And and so what now what we have now is a sense that the solutions to reversing global warming take something away that are, are subtraction, that make life more stressful, that make mm. us, you know, uh, less economically uh, secure. And that sort of that it's been exploited by both the climate deniers, but um, by others in such a way to make most people afraid instead of engaged. I, I've spent some time with your book. I love your book. It's so beautiful. 
But the other thing that I noticed is that I started really getting back into reverence. Like mm. reverence with nature is a really different place to come from than, oh, you know, what is this latest storm going to do to me? And the thing that I've felt myself uh, growing in is uh, reverence for human beings. I mean, we're actually part of life. We're not separate from nature. We, we're as much part of nature. And imagine if we had reverence for ourselves and for each other. What a different way to get back into connection and communication with each There's other. A wonderful story by Namante Nemquino, um, excuse me, um, by Hindu Ibrahim, excuse me. Um, she's a Chadian Udabi pastoralist whose mother mm. did something very extraordinary and educated her. And she is an expert in geospatial mapping. And the pastoralists have a thousand kilometer uh, route that they take on an annual basis. And um, she, <laughs> she was talking about this idea of a seventh generation, that is that they look ahead seven generations to... Uh, understand and the action they should take today, okay? We've heard that before from the Onondaga Nation, you know, from the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee Shawnee people, excuse my mispronunciation there. Um, but what she said was something interesting. She said that we look ahead seven generations because we know and remember and we're told exactly what happened to seven generations prior. It's, you know, so we see ourselves as part of a continuity of life. And it's anathema to think that we could remove ourselves from that continuity with our culture, with our tribe, with our family, with those with whom we live and share. And so uh, we don't have that. We have no sense of the past and apparently no sense about the future in the sense of how we're acting and um, that has been, in a sense, a precious thing that indigenous people have. Um, and it is fundamentally about reverence for now, for, the, for those who, you know, succeed us, for those who preceded us, you know. And um, if we don't look at ourselves as being ancestors, because we will be, then who are we ancestors to right now? And if our role isn't to regenerate life on Earth, because it is degenerating rapidly, I ask the question, why are we here? Really, I mean, why are you here? What, what are you here to do? Why did you come? And, and you know, given what we know... Um, Every single living system on Earth is in decline, and the rate of decline is accelerating. Every industry in the world is extractive, whether it's a service industry or makes products. Mm -hmm. um, extractive means it takes life, it harms life, it destroys life. That's degeneration. We're losing our oceans, our forests, our grasslands. We're losing our mangroves, our wetlands, our speciation, our birds, our pollinators. There is not one exception, and the rate of loss is extraordinary. And so we can see in what Hurricane Ida and extreme weather and drought and you know, unquenchable fires you know, that we've had here in the Dixie Fire in Siberia, this, the, the road to degeneration, we can see the end of that road. It doesn't go much further. It's not like, well, we can you know, do this and make net zero commitments, you know, like, cool. <laughs> So really what regeneration is about is saying, you know, can we do a 180? Like, can we imagine an economy, a world, a state, a culture, a company, a business, a city, a process that actually creates more life instead of less life? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. So it's really a question, do we want to continue to steal the future, which is what we're doing? Or do we want to heal the future? Do we want to make a future that actually is truly prosperous, that does serve the needs of all living beings, of course, all human beings and all else we share the planet with? And that is, to me, the inflection point that we're at. And that's why, again, why the term regeneration was used as the title. 
Well, and you list a guiding principles of regeneration in your book. And they're the things like what you just said. Does it heal or steal the future? Does it enhance well-being or diminish it? Does it prevent disease or profit from them? Right. And there's three pages of wonderful questions like that that allow us to look through the lens of your solutions and in your book in a completely different way. It, they really do. I mean, it, it, uh, regeneration is a lens. It's a framing. It's a way of seeing the world very differently. Um, just to be sure that one doesn't think that it's out there somewhere. All 30 trillion cells in your body are regenerating every nanosecond or you wouldn't be having this conversation. So we are walking, talking, regenerative, you know, organisms, okay? And we depend on it. Well, all of life is. All of life is. It's the default mode of life. So when you stop degenerating, and there's examples in the book in terms of wilding and marine protected areas and so forth, the rate at which uh, the natural world regenerates is extraordinary. It's extraordinarily quick, much quicker than scientists had thought or expected or predicted. And so really what we're talking about is can we actually get in alignment with biology? I mean, that is life, the study of life, uh, as opposed to fighting it tooth and nail every step of the way. And because it's not going to work, it doesn't have a future. Uh, and we have a world of great suffering now. That suffering is only going to increase uh, if we turn a blind eye to it. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that about how quickly nature regenerates. Mm -hmm. Because at the very beginning of COVID, when San Francisco was just starting to um, become different um, and shut down a little bit, I met a whale at... Chrissy Field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never, I've lived here 20 years and I never met a whale there right. before. I figured she was, you know, out um, eating some sardines and munching. But I felt like I got a communication from her that was like, if you humans will just do a little bit yourselves, nature will, will yeah. regenerate. Yeah, nature. I mean... You had kangaroos going down the main street in Adelaide, you know. I mean, you had all sorts of reindeer and other animals, you know, bears all over the world showing up like, hey, you guys are chill, so let me... <laughs> it's, uh, it's quiet, I feel safe, you know, and I'm going to go walk down your main street. And we had, uh, in my house in my valley, I mean, we had fox. And um, one night, my wife and I were watching uh, something, uh, a documentary on Netflix or something, and the living room was dark, and uh, and then we went and turned the light on, and and then fox were were actually sleeping on the couch in the chair by the couch and so forth, you know. And they got looked up, going, <laughs> they kind of looked at us like, "Hey, what are you doing here?" Like, you know, not us saying, "What are you doing?" And they sort of went out, like looking back at us, you know, as if like, "Okay, well," I mean, but. Really, I felt during that time, too, the animals felt safer and they could come out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even where we were, and all over the world, that's true, because we just... We slowed down, We slowed we? down, calmed down, yeah. And when we slow down, it gives us the opportunity to listen. Well, there's an uh, 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 essay in, in there called, by Isabella Tree. She wrote a book called Wilding. It's a beautiful essay by this about she, she hus her husband, Charlie Burrell, and she... Uh, inherited this farm in Sussex in England um, unbeknownst to them. It, it, they, they knew they were going to inherit it, but not so soon. It skipped a generation. And they said it was losing money. And they, so they did everything they could to invest in agriculture, machinery, this, and more fencing and, you know, inputs. And it lost more and more money. And so finally they met an ecologist from the Netherlands called Franz Vera. And he suggested bringing back the, you know, the animals that used to be in Europe uh, and the UK, um, the horses and the pigs and the oryx with the longhorn cattle, but and to just uh, ring fence it, which they did, take out all the interior fencing, and then just let it go and watch and see what happened. And in 20 years since they did that, they have more red listed species than every conservation area in the UK put together. And they have the first pair of nesting storks 
in the UK in 600 years. They did this in 20 years. And now they have safaris, you know, people line up and pay to go and look and at the wildlife in the mm. butterflies, they have butterfly tours, they have this tours. I mean, and that's 20 years on farmland. And so it happened all by itself. The pigs made lakes. They, there's mussels there now. Where the mussels come from? I mean, they, they die for the mussels, you know. I mean, it's just astonishing the complex... Uh, relationships and associations in living systems. This intelligence, it's an innate intelligence, you know, um, that is, we keep interrupting and disrupting and crushing and killing and poisoning and burning and scraping it, you know, and, and when yet, you stop doing that, it's if, like... If we slow down and listen, mm. then we can hear that innate intelligence instead of being so dominant. Well, some people say, what's the one thing I should do? And, you know, sometimes, sometimes I don't want to answer that question. You know, like, I don't know what you should do. But then I say, what the, from my point of view, the most important thing you can do is find out where you live. You don't know where you live. We're on unceded territory of the Miwok, the coastal Miwok right here. Mm -hmm. And how many people in San Francisco know that? They don't know what the Miwok did. And, and you know, it's like and where they were and their culture, their, their traditions, you know, and... And, you know, they sustained this and, you know, with the Ohlone and others, you know, this, this whole larger ecosystem from the valleys up Sacramento, San Joaquin, the coastal areas for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years in such a beautiful way that when people came here from Europe and they went into the valley, they thought it was like Hyde Park. It was so beautiful, so well-groomed, you know. It was them, the way they interacted with their environment. And so... Um, but do, do people know the migratory birds or which ones are, are and are not? Do they know what are the natural plants? That, that is the, you know, native plants. Do they know what the invasive ones? Do, you know, do they know what lives here? What lives under the soil? Do they, I mean, we don't know where we live anymore. So we can bring our curiosity. Well, yeah, I mean, so you think nature is just sort of an abstraction. You can see a Richard Attenborough thing on BBC, you know, and say, wow. But that is with, do, not do, not I, he, he is a hero as a person, but the photography is like eco-pornography, which is you look at that and go, I'll never see that my whole life. <laughs> and so it, it also removes people from nature in a certain way. It makes mm. you feel like it's just stunning for sure and awesome. But we've got to fall in love with the nature that is ours here, you know, the bay, you know, the wetlands, you know, and I, the forest. I like to say that we're at the southern end of Salmon Nation. Right, that's which, one way. Which means like there's this whole thing that used to happen here all the way up through Vancouver and beyond, beyond. and all through the beyond. Columbia Plateau and the Columbia River. And the salmon were so thick that you could walk on top of them. They were so there were so many in that river. Well, my great grandfather, great great grandfather wrote letters and he said, when you looked at Richardson Bay, which is that bay off Sausalito to Tiburon, um, in the winter, you could not see the water. It looked like you could walk right across it. Uh, it was so full of birds. Wow. You know? So we don't know what we've lost, you know, because no, we No, but we can start to make new pictures for mm. ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I love so much about your book is that, it's, that it is all about the systems. So with, that, with those traditional indigenous cultures that were salmon people, they understood that when that bear took a salmon out of the river and he took his... Chomped it. He chomped it and he took his salmon sandwich and then he flung the rest of the salmon over on the side... And the other little four leggeds ate it. And then it fertilized the redwood trees. It fertilized the plants as yeah. well as the animals. So you start to see the connectedness, the interconnectedness of all life. Yeah, but I don't want viewers to think that regeneration is just about the untouched natural world. It's about cities. Oh, it's, yeah. It's about okay. industry. So it's tell us about a little energy. bit about your pictures. No, I mean, it's about, about the whole... Tell us about the 15-minute city. Or... Well, that's uh, Mayor Hidalgo uh, in Paris uh, is probably the vanguard of doing this. It's happening all over Barcelona and other cities, but uh, where uh, the city is designed in such a way that 
everything you need is within a 15 minute walk, or in some cases, you know, if you have a bike. Uh, and so you don't need a car. Uh, and in other words, rather than changing, okay, get an AV, you know, okay, great, but it's still a car, it's still a road, it's still traffic. Mm-hmm. And to really reimagine where the city is. And she now has uh, committed, I think, 219 million euro uh, to, um, I would call it bike proofing, but basically making Paris the quintessential biking city. And not just green lanes, but also safe ones, places to park, places to get your bikes, you know, actually fixed and main- maintained and so forth. And they've also created the Eau de Paris, which is basically the water of Paris. And so everywhere in Paris, you can get absolutely the best water in your water bottle. In in just, there it is, you know, free. And, and so getting rid of plastic by... You get rid of plastic by supplying the need, not by saying, don't use plastic. Fair enough. But then what are people going to do when they need water, you know, and so forth? I mean, not everybody carries a water bottle, but there everybody has an incentive to do so because the French people are very much into quality water. I mean, they serve it, you know, at at lunch and and dinner. And so, um, again, so it's the reimagination of the city, and then you also see the nature cities where people are putting in microforests and and, and greening buildings, literally. I mean, not like just energy use, but it's plants, you know. You see uh, the Bosco Verticale that uh, Stefano Boeri did in Milano, where basically it's a vertical forest. Um, He was the first to do it. It's being done all over the world now, especially of all places, China. I mean, and so you're you're imagining instead of some trees in a city, a city in a forest. In other words, it's a figure ground shift. Mm -hmm. And what that does to noise, to air quality, that gives rid of noise, to air quality, to pollinators, birds, wonder, nature, what it does to children, what it does to... Uh, neighborhoodliness, that is to say, the happiness and the the joy and the sense of community that can arise from that instead of one that's all concrete and cars going back and forth all day long and you have to close your window and put in air air conditioning and, you know, to, it's like, it's a very different place to live. And so that's part of regeneration too. Just as important, you know, because there's 7.8 billion of us and most of us live in cities. So we're not just talking about the regeneration of forests and grasslands and farmlands and degraded land. We're talking about the oceans as well. We're talking about the regeneration of habitat, where people live, our habitats, not just the habitat of creatures. Well, and it seems to me like there's some synergies there that we don't even think about. I mean, like human beings breathe out carbon dioxide and the plants breathe it in. So there's like these unseen uh, synergies that uh, that we don't even think about. But when you say that about a city that's more forest than city, I feel like, oh, finally we can breathe. Yeah, and and I want to move there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I want to live there, you know. It's like, where would you want to be, you know? Everybody wants to be in that place. They don't want to be in a concrete jungle, uh, and regardless of income level. And so, and also to make that happen with fairness and justice and equity. So it's not just, you know, the rich neighborhoods with the big lawns, you know, and they get all the trees, which is, hap- which is what's happened in virtually every city in America. And uh, it's like, no, that doesn't work. And so this uh, idea of uh, justice and fairness is ex- equity is so important to reversing global warming um, because if we don't, then we still have the mindset that it's something other that we fix as the privileged people, which the we are, we are, know it for sure, but we're, we're going to fix it, you know, for who and how. And if we aren't creating a, a means and a way and a sense of engagement and inclusion for the 4.3 billion, 3 billion people who live in impoverished conditions, then we'll fail will fail. If we stop talking about future existential threat, please stop talking about it. That's scientifically true. It goes right by everybody. The brain doesn't care 
about future existential threat. We're not wired that way. We're wired to current existential threat. And most of the world wakes up every morning concerned about that day's existential threat, whether it's money, education, food, security, health. You know, I mean, it, I mean, that's what people wake up with. So the interesting thing, again, going back to the website uh, of the book, uh, regeneration.org, if you look at those solutions, and it's the world's most complete listing of climate solutions and how to get them done, if you took away climatological, well, climatology altogether, it's like it does, it, a science, we never thought of it before, we didn't do it. Okay, we don't have a single climate scientist. If you took away you know, any implication that extreme weather was caused by anything other than just whatever, it's a random you know, event, you know, it's not amplified by warming, you take both of those off the table and you look at those solutions, we would want to do every single one of those solutions um, on their own merit because they have cascading benefits for people everywhere and particularly for people who live in impoverished conditions. There's no such thing as a poor person. There's a human being who lives in impoverished conditions. And what I say in the book, if you want to know the cause of poverty, go look who's benefiting. Then you'll know the cause. And so we have an opportunity here to actually come together in a way because the possibilities that are inherent in regeneration uh, address so many other issues, challenges, problems that we separate in different silos as if they were disconnected. And they're not disconnected. But I imagine like in your the city that you just described where things are close by and we get out of our cars, we can start to have a sense of being connected to each other again and having communities. And my feeling in research is that the more we have strong communities, the more we can hold all the edges. Well, oh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've individuated, uh, you know, advertisers and social media, too, have doubled down on that. But we have made every person so uh, uh, acutely be believing that they're an individual. <laughs> and they're not. There's no such thing as an individual. We are part of complex networks, just like everything else in nature. And you take away that complex network of our friends, our family, our neighborhood, our community, our city, you know, our clubs, our companies, our classes, our colleges, I can go on, our churches, our mosques, our temples, whatever. I mean, you take all that away and basically you're one lonely person and you'll die soon because you, it's not that you can't live in the wild by yourself, you can, but our life depends on this interconnection we have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we see ourselves you know, in that way, and we act that way, and we act it out, and as the world becomes more challenging and stressful, then we double down on our individuality. We're going to take care of myself first, you know, and so whether it's like making more money or, you know, buying a gun or moving someplace, and all, you know, we're, we're acting out the wrong scenario, which is that all of life is a community, soil is a community, all health comes from the soil, you treat soil like dirt, and there goes your health system, animal health, human health. So, I mean, so there is an offering here. It's not as though, um, you know, it, it's like, it's like a, we, it's a curse, and we have to deal with it. You know, oh my God, I got born at the wrong time. Really, the way I see it is that uh, we're being homeschooled by mom, by Mother Earth. Okay, she's homeschooling us. And <laughs> which is thank you. And she's been trying to do it for a long time and we're not really listening, you know, to the lesson plan. But lesson plan always number one is really being in alignment with biology. Mm. And again it goes back to the fact that nature never makes a mistake. So what are we doing that's out of alignment? And can we do something that's in alignment that actually meets human needs on all levels, you know, whether it's emotionally, culturally, uh, nutritionally, health education, uh, connection, art, music. I mean, all these things are human needs or human exp expressions or what it means to be humanity. And so regeneration is the core of that because it really has got big arms. And when you start to say, you know, well, I'm going to fight climate change, people go, show me. I mean, it's like that doesn't have big arms. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, even if you're into sports, you know, 
uh, that isn't very attractive. And so that's why regeneration the title. And ending the climate crisis in one generation means that by 2030, we will have started to move at such a rate and such a way that we can see our way through the crisis. It doesn't end our work. It actually expands and grows and burgeons more and more by 2030. But it's not as though it's going to be, you know, okay, we got that fix. It's not a fix. It's not a fix. Yeah. You know, because as soon as you think it's a fix, it's an it. That's what Bill Gates says. It. I said, Bill, what's it? Tell me what it is, you know. And I think that the more we learn that interconnectedness, the more we'll be able to feel the shift. Like, well, recognize it. It's just, it's a, we're surrounded by it in, in, in the sense we have duped ourselves <laughs> because we are so beautifully, intricately uh, interconnected. I mean, everything that we see, uh, well, whether it's inside our body, which we can see, but understand our bodies, but outside uh, is just extraordinary. And one of the things that uh, we talk about in, in, in regeneration is indigeneity, that is the indigenous cultures. And, um, and there's 5,000 of them. They, and maybe they've been li listening a little bit better than some of the rest of us. Well, much more than that. They weren't listening. They were, they were observational scientists. There's 5,000 cultures. They have 4 to 5% of the land in the world that's under their control or was their tribal land. And 80% uh, and of the world's remaining biodiversity is on that land. That's not a coincidence. That's a practice. That's a culture. That's an understanding. And what indigenous people did um, by pragmatism, they had to which is to know where they live. And that came from observation. That's observational science, which is different than empirical science. Empirical science, you do an experiment. If you can't repeat it, then it's not a truth. In other words, you have to repeat it, right? It's repeatable. Nature never repeats itself. Right. So that's a whole different uh, type of science. Darwin was an observational science, by the way. So it's, it's in our culture as well. But um, so observational science is really pattern recognition and looking at the relationships, you know, they're complex, and then creating ways to grow that understanding and pass on that understanding to succeeding generations. And they did that through rituals, through song, through celebration, through star stories, through narratives. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is how they passed it on. And we think that the indigenous people were illiterate. They didn't have a written language, so therefore they could not never be as smart as we were with all our writing. And what we don't understand is that they had memories that are extraordinary. They had a hippocampus, part of the brain, that could store incredible amounts of information. I mean, there's 700 stories that the Diné people, the Navajo, have about 700 different insects. Get out of here. Who even can identify 700 different insects? You know, we have the Micmac in Nova Scotia who could walk by, you know, a mother tree, which we're going to see when this is over. And we'll see a short clip about the mother tree and Suzanne Samard. They walk by these sort of main trees in the forest, and uh, and they would listen to the wind soughing through the branches, and. The sound that they heard became the name of the tree. There was a specific name for that tree. They could go by that tree five, ten years later, and they remembered the name. They listened to the sound, and they could tell whether the tree was healthy or something had happened to it. Now, what do you call that? We, it's unimaginable intelligence and understanding. And talk about observational science, just by the, sa the, name and the, na the name and the sound, you can make the correlation. Again, pattern recognition. I can tell so many stories like this. And this is the treasure that, you know, Cortez and all these, you know, El Dorado, all these things came to get the gold and silver. They missed the treasure, which is this exquisite understanding of place. And if we don't recapture that understanding of our place and our relationship to it, we won't be here. The earth is going to regenerate. There's no question. It's either going to do it with us or without us. But we no have question. curiosity. Each of us has curiosity to investigate those parts of our ingenuity that 
us, speak to us. And that, well, that, I hope each of us does. I don't think each of us does. I think each of us could. And, and it's there, like just this amazing world, you know, and understanding of the world in relationship to it. Regeneration offers that as well, you know. So, again, it's, it's you know, like I said, we are innately regenerative. Anything we do when we care, we care about our mate, we care about our children, we care about our neighbors, we care about our friends, we care when we go to church or the mosque or, the, you know, the temple and so forth, and we pray, what are we praying for? I mean, it is about care, care for the future, care for others, care for those around us there, care for those who are not as well um, cared for, you know, the dispossessed and the poor and those who are suffering and so forth. We care a lot. Caring is regeneration. That, that is the, yeah. the expression of regeneration. So that's, again, why the title is there, because it's innate to who we are as opposed to being an add- add-on, you know. And... Uh... So I've been making a little list for myself of like, okay, well, what should go on my punch list, right? Well, explain what a punch list is. So uh, in the book, <laughs> there's this idea that each of us either personally or if we're small business people in our small business, but we can each start to think about, okay, well, here I am, here's what makes me curious or makes me want to engage. And so the first thing that was on mine was investigate my last seven generations. Like, Mm. I don't even know Mm. who, I mean, I can go back to my grandfather or my great grandfather, but can I really go back beyond? Like, so I put that one on the list. I put um, investigating this a network of trees idea, like the whole idea that they all connect with each other. Um, so learning, that's your, so you're learning about the past and you're learning about basically the trees actually are co- uh, a community that communicate to each other. And that maybe that gesture of communications is really different than the Darwinian survival of the fittest. Maybe there's another model that has to do with helping each other and being a community and passing resources back and forth instead. What a different community we would have if that were the mentality that we had the same way that the trees do. Yeah. Well, the punch list came from reading Otto Gawande's book, Checklist. And he was a surgeon, is a surgeon. And he noticed how airplane pilots and co-pilots, when they're flying, you know, these big jumbo jets, they have two clipboards uh, and they check every single aspect of that plane in terms of, you know, you know, you've seen the dials on one, you know, a plane, you know, the dashboard of the plane is just mind bending and so forth. They're checking every single aspect of that plane's readiness to fly. And then they switch and they do it again. They do it a second time. And then, and only then are they ready to fly the plane. Okay. So what, uh, Gwande discovered was that in the hospitals where he was and other hospitals, the rate of malpractice and mistakes that happened in surgery, uh, were avoidable mm. because those are being those, they were mistakes and afterwards you know in hospitals they do get together and say oh god you took out the wrong kidney how'd that happen you know I mean th- there's a reason well so, you know there was a mistake made obviously but also some observational science maybe no going it's not then. observational science it's just observation yeah it's just like you screwed up that's not <laughs> science that's like I won't say it online but I mean, um, and so, no, it's like, and then he said, well, what a surgeon should have is a checklist. And a lot of surgeons really resisted that because, you know, they're the king of this, you know, medical world, you know, brain surgeon. And they resisted it, but the hospitals then insisted upon it and they, in, in, they, they, they uh, implemented it. And then malpractice and surgical mistakes dropped by 75%. So How much? I, 75 percent. Wow. Okay. Just from having a checklist. So what I did in regeneration is create punch lists, which is, you know, when you actually make a list of things that you're going to do, you're much more likely to do them, whether this week or this month or this year. I have a punch list up there, too. 
And one of the things I want to do is remove fossil fuels completely from my house. And so I may have a little scar here from putting in the heat pump. Um, but I, I'm getting rid of natural gas for water, for heating, and for cooking. You know, and I can't wait to call PG&E and say, would you come get your gas meter? It's on my property, and I don't need it. Thank you so much. You know, but to, and not only that, I use less energy, because heat pumps use much less energy per BTU of warm than natural gas. And so I reduce my energy input, and all the energy is coming from marine clean energy, so it's all renewable. So... You know, that's w one of the eight or nine things on my punch list. Everybody is different. And the reason I wanted to do the punch list for people to share is the idea that somehow there is, this is what you should do. You know, I was brought up Catholic and I was an altar boy and this is what you should do or you screwed up or it's a venal sin, it's an ordinary sin, it's a mortal sin, you know, like guilt. Get rid of that and really use your imagination as to what it is, you know, that's going to actually... Um, be regenerative, you know. And I, there's a, a lad that goes to uh, um, camps, you know, these uh, settlement camps, these refugee camps, the big, huge ones like the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh, and he teaches uh, children art. He makes these big murals and puts them out in paint. They're not being, not being taught anything at all, you know. And this is now they're going to paint and ex painting their trauma as well. You know, expressing themselves. And that's regeneration, too. And so that, it's really important that we, we see it in this really broad and encompassing uh, sense as opposed to, you know, my you know, childhood Catholic sense of, like, you better do this or we're screwed, which is a lot of the rhetoric around climate, you know. And I'm not saying that the science isn't right there. If we don't get things done, we are screwed. <laughs> but, but it just isn't an inviting narrative, you know, to people. And so I wanted to open it up so people could see how each other are responding. And again, it's not just you as an individual, it's you as a family, you as your network, you as your company, you as your neighborhood. It could be any you that you want to describe, usually first person or, or plural. But also, as, as people stop and ask you, well, Paul, what do you think I should do? Then to turn that back and give the mirror so I can write down yeah. what it is that I mean, I'm get ideas from other to. people's lists too. Yeah, I mean, like I say, they're imaginative and they're wonderful, and they're and because people are imaginative and they are wonderful, and so why not bathe in that and you know celebrate that and instead. In a um, in a conversation that I listened to you having with Mark Hyman, mm -hmm. who's a functional medicine doctor a guy who's into root causes of our chronic diseases. I know that the best ways to change our lifestyle is to do it in groups. Like even if you have seven or eight people to egg each other on, it's so much better than that January make a resolution and in five minutes you already forgot that you promised to run around the neighborhood every day. Yeah. So having it in groups. And so I'm wondering, maybe we could have some of this list making, punch lists in groups where we could egg each other on. Well, we, we might have uh, foreseen what you just said. Uh, we have something that's not complete yet called Climate Action Systems. And it is for a group to form and learn together about a specific solution or activity uh, or challenge. For example, there are challenges like acidification of the ocean, loss of coral reefs, the loss of the boreal forest, the biggest stock of carbon in the world on terrestrial systems. Those are challenges. You know, obviously we want to solve them and protect them and change them, but I wouldn't call them solutions so much as challenges and so forth. But anyway, the point being climate action systems is a way for people to connect in uh, and uh, learn together. Because we are homo sapiens. That's why we're here, not Neanderthals, because we like to learn together, work together, you know, uh, solve problems together. I mean, that's who we are naturally. And so to your point, exactly. And that's what Climate Action Systems is coming. The website is a work in progress. We had a lot of ideas about what we wanted to do, but you know, we're understaffed and, and, and over-enthusiastic. Uh, and so <laughs> those things are coming. And that, that'll be there in maybe a month or two. But yeah. anybody could form a yeah, group absolutely. to, like a reading group or a right. egging each other on group. The thing about the Climate Action System, which is different, which is a learning module, which is, can be disseminated. That is, you can pass it on. You can, 
you know, you're in Boston, you know, and you say, well, you can send it to somebody in Belgium, you know, so you can send it to somebody in Ohio. In other words, you can learn from others learning and so forth. And you can say, this is applicable to Austin, Texas, but this one's not applicable. And then, so you're actually creating learning pods that self-replicate. And the imitation there, what we're trying to do is imitate natural systems, which is their self-organizing systems, you know. So we're trying to create in the website and what we do the conditions for self-organization. We're not trying to organize. We're not trying to tell people what to do. We're not trying to... Not at all. It doesn't work anyway. We're trying to create the conditions in which people can imagine, create, connect, and act. And, uh, and that's the only way, really, I mean, with all the respect to the Conference of the Parties, that we're going to reverse global warming because that engages the bulk of humanity. I'm getting a lot of pressure um, from all of the interested parties online who are sending in questions. Let's go. And so one <laughs> of them is Lynn, Twi Lynn oh, Twist. Yeah. And she says, congratulations on your new book. Regeneration is clearly the way forward. It is time to put life at the center of every decision. Bravo, Paul and team. Then there's this whole batch of questions that have to do with communication. Uh, I got one from Brazil, and he was asking, um, reflecting on the first book and um, getting the feedback that you did, what have you learned about communicating around this idea? And another person who's asking about communications is saying, are there um, particular communication techniques that work best in motivating the general public to act? Like, there are some things, uh, you're not just a guy in a bar now. You've really <laughs> done some I don't drink. <laughs> observational work on what people respond to and how to communicate. Yeah, the first question is, is quite correct. I mean, I gave 128 talks in public in 22 months after drawdown and you never as my grandfather said you never learn anything when your mouth is open and uh you learn it by listening and i find and found the questions to be gold because usually they're asked on behalf of more people than the questioner understood and you know other people say yeah that's my question too uh, and to me, they gave, they're very, whether you like the question or didn't, you should like them all because basically they were representative of how people were perceiving, seeing, understanding the, the world as it is or your work, if the case was about the book itself. And what I learned is in regeneration. I mean, that's why I did regeneration. I had it in mind before uh, Drawdown was published, but it was the experience of, of, of Drawdown in, and being out in the world post drawdown uh, that actually created that book. Uh, and so there are a thousand voices in that book, a thousand questions, a thousand, you know, people like the question from Brazil, you know, saying, asking what about this, that, this, all these different questions, you know, and, uh, and I've tried to incorporate them and integrate them in such a way as for people to feel a sense of openness and spaciousness as opposed to, I know you don't listen up. It's not what the book's about. I could have said in the beginning of the book, well, it's all connected. True. It's a truism. It's a cliche. It's systems theory 101. And it is so banal. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And instead... Well, and it's here, uh, not it, here. Well, it's just you know, it's just words. And so what I did in the book um, is basically make connections in different solutions in different sections of the book. Make connections, make connections, make connections. This, and like, who knew? Oh, this is connected to that. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And so forth. So the reader, so whether she or he is in fifth grade or graduate school or, you know, wherever, it doesn't matter where they are, as they go through the book and they read it, they began to think, wow, gosh, it's all connected. Now, they have changed their mind. It's not my job to change people's minds. That's not my job. I have a very difficult time changing my mind, so I know better full well not to try to change anybody else's and so forth. My job as a journalist, as a writer, is to create the spaciousness for people to come to an understanding that is innate and inherent to them, not me. 
Um, and that's the difference between, uh, I think, regeneration, not in Drada, I did that in Drada as well, but, but in other books about climate right now, which are very didactic, very imperative, very declarative. And I think they're true. I, I don't argue with the books and so forth, not at all. But I, I don't think psychologically they actually accomplish what is tr the authors are trying to accomplish in terms of bringing us together and opening up the imagination. Ending the climate crisis in one generation is what I call an unreasonable goal. Like a lot of people say, oh, forget about it, what are you talking about? They're talking 2050 in Glasgow right now and you're saying one generation. I explain what I mean by that, but more importantly, it is if you have reasonable goals, you know, then they're reasonable because you know how to do it. And the goals that actually bring out from us something that is really authentically novel and new and creative and innovative and imaginative is when you have a goal that you set out and you say, I don't know how to do this. Ah, that is such a, such a wonderful moment. It's like, so what do you do then? Well, you learn, you understand, you delve, you reflect, you ask, you read, you search, you, but you're always thinking in a very different way than if it's a reasonable goal. And that's why the subtitle is an unreasonable goal. Okay, got it. Yeah. So the, the next set of questions, because we're, um, we're getting short on our time, has to be more popcorn um, style. Okay, so yeah, we'll, well just that's like... not my... <laughs> Not my well, just bent, like but I, I'll tell, okay, I'll blurt. Okay, uh, so um, uh, this is from St Stuthmate. Um, Dr. Hawken, do you think the development of advanced nuclear power, small modular reactors, should be pursued as a source of carbon-free dispatchable energy? Um, it depends, I and mean, it's been around for a long time. It, there's 70 different companies that want to do it. Uh, the regulatory hurdles for that are such that I think it's another 10 years away. Uh, at the same time, uh, it still does, produces plutonium, which is weapon grades. So we haven't solved that problem with the smaller nuclear reactors. They're safer, no question about it. Uh, and I think we have some issues that aren't being understood, which is, do you want one in your neighborhood? And it may be small, <laughs> but where are you going to put them? <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of obstacles going ahead. Uh, I'm much more interested in what tri -alpha Technology is doing in UC Irvine and Irvine itself in terms of they're building the fifth reactor, fusion reactor, not fission, and they've already achieved long enough, hot enough, and I'm more interested in that. Either way, the questioner makes a really good point, which is we need baseload power. And that's, he's absolutely right. This one's from George Steffner, and he says, how much of climate concern is justified, and how much is propaganda? Simulated, stimulated hysteria is what he writes. Well, uh, basically, that, to that question, who is the propaganda coming from? Uh, the book Regeneration has 7,262 citations. Uh, they're on the website. He's welcome to go look at the citations. And if he can write and show me one piece of propaganda, I would be very grateful. Uh, okay, so last two questions. Right. Um, the first one is um, from Melissa, and she says, are we able to envision a planet where humans are not the center of everything? Perhaps that's at the core of our 180-degree shift? Well, that takes just a second to envision that one. It just, it's a matter of changing your own perception. We're not at the center and the earth is proving it um, because, you know, we basically our living systems and our cities and our homes and our farm systems and so many things are just being wiped out and are being, you know, lighting up on fire, all that sort of stuff. So um, if we think we're at the center, uh, the, uh, it, it, that's an interesting paradigm to hold on to, but I, I don't think it's proven out in fact right now. Ah. Center of destruction, yes. Yes, or false control. Right. So Arnav asks, is technology changing, the our, changing our innate quality on a biological level of caring? And can shareholders, consumers demand companies be more aware of that impact? Well, those are two different questions. The first question is a really interesting 
fascinating anthropological question. The second, I'm not gonna, I don't have time for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. The second one, um, in uh, regeneration.org, uh, it talks about every solution that it, it's a how-to, and it's three, 4,000 words, and it's links, 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 links. We're not telling you how to do it. This is people who are doing it, understand it. What you can do as an individual, as a company, as a city, as a class, as a, you know, whatever group you want. And it also talks about influence, which is really, really important. That is to say, this is where you can have influence, and whether it's on a corporation, or whether it's on a county supervisor, whether it's in your city council, whether it's a national government or provincial government. And these are the areas in which individual, that is, communication can make a difference. And we also talk about bad actors. So the boreal forest, which, as I said earlier, is the largest stock of of carbon on Earth, you know, on terrestrial systems, is being, you know, clear cut to make charm and toilet paper by Procter and Gamble, and also Kimberly Clark and Georgia Pacific, uh, so that we can wipe our ass with something that's really soft and plush. Okay, and uh, and so we actually give the instead of making it with hemp and bamboo and recycled paper, which are, make toilet paper just as well, and and what we do is we give the the name of the CEO of Procter & Gamble, uh, his email, his phone number, and it's in on the website. And so I'm sure he would like to hear from you if you think that's really a bad idea. So to make squeezing soft charm and toilet paper out of this most amazing carbon stock on Earth. We have to protect the carbon that's here uh, and not send it up into the atmosphere. Well, on that note, I would say... Gratitude to you, thank you, and gratitude to Mother Nature that's put us in this place. I think we've all, on some level, we've all chosen to be here and be part of the solution in this world at this time. And I'm, I think the Commonwealth Club is really grateful to be allies with you along the. This. Thank you so much. I love the Commonwealth Club, and I love being here with you. Thank you so much, and thanks to all the staff here, by the way, who rock. I wanted to thank the Commonwealth Club members here at the club and our online audience, as well as our radio audience and the folks at the club who helped to produce these great events. Sean and Mark and Alex and Spencer and Arnav and Kara and Gloria and Adam and uh, John and Shelley and George and Cindy. Thank you to all. It takes a team. Yeah. It really does. And uh, now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating almost 120 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Elizabeth.